The Bread of Life discourse of John's Gospel continues this morning as it harkens back to the manna, the bread from heaven that sustained the Israelites for 40 years. The origin of the word manna reminds me of a corny joke that I was going to omit, and then I saw Paul Killian, so I thought I might as well go ahead. (laughs) The origin of the name for Worcestershire sauce. An English earl was entertaining a dinner guest from America, a guy from Texas, and the chef served steaks with a new, yet unnamed, seasoning sauce. The Texan really liked the sauce, and so he asked, Was this here sauce? Hence the name. <laughs> That's in Paul's you know, category. <laughs> now, not a joke at all, but a fact. That is essentially how the manna was named. The bread from heaven that the Israelites ate during their desert wanderings. It was the question the Israelites of the Exodus asked when they first saw the strange, flaky substance from heaven that was all around the campsite. The first time they saw it, they pointed at it and said, Mana, Hebrew for what's that? And the name stuck. Manna, what's that? Today, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What could Jesus possibly mean when he called himself the bread of life? What's that? Mana. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Perhaps our most basic need for daily bread is to be reminded of our basic dependence upon God. In the difficulties and devastations that come our way, whatever they be, there are times in each of our lives when we hit a brick wall. And we eventually figure out that spinning our wheels or continuing to hit our heads against that brick wall are not truly our best options when it comes to alleviating the pain or misery. Today's gospel asserts that the answer lies somewhere within the bread of life. So what's that, really? Mana. The same question is often asked by children about the bread we call the Eucharist. It happens right up here at the table from time to time. What's that? It has been said, due to its shape and taste, that it's hard enough to believe that the host is bread, let alone believe something much more profound, that it is the body of Christ. One such child, who happens now to be my wife, recalls her early experience of what many religious people, Episcopalians among them, consider to be the bread of life, to which Jesus refers in the gospel today. From first through sixth grades, Peg attended OLPH school in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was called OLPH because it was just too much to say Our Lady of Perpetual Help Roman Catholic Grammar School. Peg and her classmates once visited, really, the local Phoenix television station's children's program of Wallace and Ladmo, two funny guys. The kids were wearing their school uniforms with OLPH on the lapel, and Wallace asked the children, what's Olf school? Who was Olf? The nuns who taught at OLPH, not Olf, were sisters of Seton Hill, or Mother Seton nuns. At the time, before the Vatican Council changes, these particular nuns' uniform or habit was unique. Not your typical nuns' habit. This habit featured a black bonnet rather than a veil. The sisters of Seton Hill all dressed like their founder, 19th century Elizabeth Ann Seton. As a little girl, Peg was terrified of those bonneted nuns, probably because her first grade teacher was not a very happy person and was a very strict disciplinarian. Actually, says Peg says she was mean, (laughs) and she seemed to enjoy getting angry at the little first-grade urchins. To this day, seeing a bonnet on someone, anyone, gives Peg a start. So be careful around Easter time. (laughs) Gratefully, Peg's second-grade teacher was a lay woman. Her name was Mrs. O'Malley, and Peg really liked her partly because her dad worked for O'Malley Lumber, and she loved going there on Saturdays and 
Mrs. O'Malley had nothing to do with the O'Malley lumber, but it still made a connection for her. But especially after her first great experience of the Mother Seton nun in the scary bonnet. The second reason, however, that Peg loved Mrs. O'Malley was that she was the teacher who prepared her for her first Holy Communion. In spite of the scary bonnet nuns around, First Holy Communion was a precious time and a holy memory for Peg. As much as a second grader could take in the theology or could actually understand this bread of heaven that she was to receive, it was for her an awesome experience. She was so excited to get her First Holy Communion dress and with its white shoes and sheer white veil. They look like little brides, you know, if you've ever seen them. Thankfully, the nuns didn't think to have the girls wear bonnets like they did. (laughs) But more than that, for whatever reason, and of course the reason would be God's grace, Peg was very moved by the holiness of it all, the sacredness of this body of Christ that she was so privileged to receive at the tender age of seven. I remember my first Holy Communion at age seven also, as well as the awe that accompanied it, but also the terror of having to go to confession in the little dark closet confessional beforehand. And we were instructed to not even think of touching the host. It was placed upon our tongue. We were cautioned, or rather seriously warned, to let the priest pick it up if it were to drop on the floor somehow. Since at that time, and still today, Catholics do not receive from the cup, that dry little host could present quite a problem, for we were taught not to chew the host, but to let it dissolve on our tongue. This took a while, so we had quite some time to dwell upon what we had just received. Some kids had trouble with the host getting stuck on the roof of their mouth, And if they dared to consider putting their finger in their mouth to pry the host off, Peg recalls seeing a bonneted nun suddenly appear with a withering, don't you dare, stare. (laughs) All of these holy and fond memories came back to Peg and myself as we read together through chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, because we're reading through it this whole month, the Bread of Life Discourse. For Elijah, in our first reading this morning, the bread of that angel was not ordinary bread because it sustained him for 40 days. The bread that you receive at this table this morning, the bread Peg and I received for the first time as seven-year-olds, sustains you for a whole week. To go from this base camp, sustained with the bread of life, to do the work God has called you to do this week, So what is that work for you this week? The bread of life. Mana. What's that? Amen.